ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار All praises due to Allah We praise him We ask Allah's assistance and we seek Allah's forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. And I bear witness as you bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger. May Allah exalt his mention, grant him peace and send his blessings upon him. upon his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the end of time. O you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear him the way he deserves it. And do not die except in a state of Islam or submission. O mankind, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul, Adam, our father. And from him he created his spouse, his partner, Eve, and from them he dispersed Many men and women upon earth, ourselves, those who came before us and those who will come after us. And fear Allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and keep the kinship ties or reverence the wombs that bore you. Verily Allah is ever watchful over you. O you who have believed, fear Allah and say that which is correct and straight. Allah will rectify your deeds, your affairs and will forgive you your sins. And whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger has attained the greatest success. As to what follows, verily the most truthful speech is the Quran, the book of Allah. And the best way of life and the best guidance and the best example to be followed is that of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of affairs are the ones which we introduce into this deen of ours. Because every newly introduced matter is an innovation. And every innovation will lead astray. And whatever is astray will wind up in the hellfire. When we say that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers in Islam, we must do so according to what has been revealed. Because you will find that a main point of distinction between the teachings of Islam and the teaching of other faiths or religions or ideologies or philosophies is that most of the time what they believe about God is what is suitable for them. It's a customized deity. They add and delete. And they increase and decrease as they see fit. So it's more like they have created their own God as opposed to believing that God created them. However, when we come to Islam, we find that this door has been closed completely. Everything that you and I need to know about Allah Azza wa Jal has been revealed explicitly. There is no ambiguity, there is no confusion, and there is no chaos in what we believe. We believe in the names and attributes of Allah because Allah has names 
which we call on him by, and he has attributes which we believe in, that have an effect on us in our lives. And it is not for a believer to follow the way of other religions by rejecting anything which Allah described himself with. I'm saying this because there's a quality of Allah Azza wa Jal which we should believe in as believers. And sadly, as I address you at the moment, the number of Muslims around the world who don't believe in this attribute are many. And I'm glad and I hope that you don't know them. But the truth of the matter is, we have many denominations that came into Islam and caused division within the ranks of the Muslims because of people reverting from some other religion. So they brought with them their previous belief system and they tried to integrate it with the Islamic one. And so we came up with many different creeds that Muslims believe in that were not known at the time of the Sahaba. Radiallahu anhum ajma'een. The Sahaba believed the same thing. Nowadays, we believe many things. However, the only option we have which will guarantee salvation on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and before that in this dunya is following strictly the footsteps of the Sahaba in terms of what they believed, in terms of how they conducted themselves, in terms of their Iman, in terms of the application of Islam and all the things which you can think of that you know about the Sahaba we have to to the best of our ability because we're far away from being like them to emulate them in order to attain success so what is that quality that someone denies or some Muslims deny the quality of love does Allah love Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does Allah love certain people? Or does Allah love certain qualities? Or does Allah love certain places? Indeed. While some claim that this is a quality of weakness, they say that it's, it's weak to love. Love is a sign of weakness and Allah is, is strong and, and beyond being weak. So it cannot be that Allah loves because we are attributing to Allah a quality that doesn't befit his majesty. And you can't help but wonder whether these individuals ever read the book of Allah, which is full of the ayat speaking about love. And so same goes with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The other extreme is the one that is propagated by different religions, that God or Allah should be all love. You hear the common you know, Christian may come and say to you, even though he doesn't know you, says, Jesus loves you. Did he tell you that? From, from where did you get that? On what basis are you telling me what, how Jesus feels? Oh, we saw, you know, Jesus is God and, and he loves everyone. God is love. Fine. Do you believe in the hellfire? Yes. So who is it for? Who is the hellfire for? If God loves everyone, why did he create the hellfire? And why would he place people in there to burn eternally? Where's the love there? So we have to understand that this idea that Allah loves everyone because they're all his creatures is incorrect. Iblis is one of the creatures of Allah. And we know that he is the enemy of Allah. So we have a moderate approach to the concept of love. Love is a quality which Allah possesses, Allah has, and it's a quality which we have to acquire as believers. We have to do certain things or have particular qualities which will bring about Allah's love. And this is the subject of the khutbah. What are the things or the qualities which Allah loves? And do we have them? In case we don't have them, Alhamdulillah, we can start working on it. Now that we're alive, and Allah has decreed that this event takes place, and that these reminders are brought to our attention, including myself, it's an opportunity to try once again 
to become better Muslims so we can attain Allah's love. Because there's nothing more valuable in this whole entire world than being loved by Allah. Forget about being loved by your spouse and by your boss and by your colleagues and by your friends and even by your parents. If everybody on earth loved one of us and then we wound up in the hellfire, this love will not be able to do anything in regards to minimizing or decreasing the punishment in hell. That love will not save someone from the punishment of Allah. That love will not intercede for anyone on Yawm Al Qiyamah. However, if Allah loved the person, then if even if the whole of mankind conspired against this person in an attempt to make him to go to the hellfire, and Allah loves this person, had decreed that he will not enter the hellfire, no one will be able to change that on Yawm Al Qiyamah. So what else do we want? Nothing. Once we acquire the love of Allah, everything else is easy and insignificant. So what are the qualities? We have to read the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in numerous ayat, the verb yuhibbu, because the noun is hub or the adjective as well. And the verb is yuhibbu. Of course, in, English, in Arabic grammar, it gets more complicated. That's not the time to explain. But whenever you read in the book of Allah and you read the term, inna Allah yuhibbu, know that it's saying, verily Allah loves. So the first ayah which Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, or the first ayah which I will quote from among those which I mention, is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ أَحْسِنُوا This is a verb. It's a command. It's an imperative sentence. And ihsan is usually translated as good. But that's not good enough. The actual translation is excellence. Ihsan is excellence. So excel, meaning go to the top. Do the best which is within your ability. And what is the end result? Verily, Allah loves those who excel. Ihsan is explained by the scholars as being three things primarily. Bathlun nada. To spend from what Allah has given you, not necessarily money. Anything which Allah gave you, position, status, you're respected in your community, anything which you can do to help Muslims in whatever skills Allah gave you that He did not give other people, then you utilize them in the service of Islam and the Muslims. This is the concept of Bathlun Nada. Secondly, Kafful Adha. Avoiding harm. Don't harm the Muslims. Don't harm your brothers. Don't backbite. Don't gossip. Don't spread mischief. And the list goes on. Avoiding harm. And lastly, talaqatul wajhi. Smiling. When you see your brothers in faith, you smile. A smile is, is something that is often on your face. Now, there are times of seriousness, like khutbatul jumu'ah. This is, for example, an instance when the Prophet sallallahu as, as was described by Jabir radiallahu anhu, that on yawmul jumu'ah, when the messenger of Allah would deliver the sermon, his voice will get loud, and his eyes will get red, and he will become angry, as if he is a general in the army, warning his soldiers against being attacked. This is the context of jumu'ah. Because people have the tendency to fall asleep. People have the tendency to relax. And if the khatib addresses them in a soft manner, then this will make matters worse. And some people don't come to any salah anyways except on Jumu'ah. They don't listen to any lectures except on Jumu'ah. The only time you have an opportunity to get to the segment of people is on Yawmul Jumu'ah. This is the time for the wake-up call. Otherwise, smiling. This is Ihsan in regards to what? In regards to the creatures. But the real Ihsan is explained by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, 
when Jibreel asked him, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَانِ قَالَ أَنْ تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ to worship Allah as if you can see him. And of course, we know no one can see Allah in the dunya. La tudriku al-absar, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sight cannot encompass Allah. The believers will see Allah azza wa in the life to come. But in this dunya, it cannot happen. Even Musa, alayhi salam. Musa with his, with his status amongst the messengers from Ulul Azim, from the five mighty messengers. He asked Allah to see him. In the dunya, قَالَ رَبِّ أَرِنِي أَنظُرْ إِلَيْكَ He said, my Lord, allow me to, to, to glare at you. قَالَ لَن تَرَانِي Allah said, you will not be able to see me. So no one can see Allah in the dunya. So what is the concept of worshipping Allah as if you can see him? This is why it says, as if. كَأَنَّكَ And the scholars explain it as the first level of ihsan. That it, the, the first one in terms of being the best. Meaning, you have such desire such love in worshiping Allah, it is as if you are there. It is as if you are looking, Allah, looking at Allah and doing the ibadah right in front of Him. How would you do it? Right now we believe Allah sees us even though we don't see Allah. But if we were to see Allah in front of our eyes, what kind of salah would you make? If you were to pray before Allah and you're looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you think you'll be able to scratch the whole time in the salah and get busy with whatever people do nowadays? No, you'll, you'll have the best salah in your life. This is the concept. And that's why we can attain this level without having to see Allah Azza wa But if we're unable to, which is the sad state, then you and I should know that Allah sees us. I'll give you a worldly example. Two employees... Hired by two different companies, each one of them has his own room. And both are given a job to do that requires dedication and effort and so on and so forth. One, one office has a camera, surveillance camera, that the employee can see. And that camera has a television screen that is viewed by his mudir, in the main office. The other one does not have a camera. You will find that if you were to be in that predicament, you would do a better job and you will be more efficient when you know that the camera is looking because you know you can't have a personal phone call, nor can you put your feet on the desk, nor can you just hang out or fall asleep because you worry that the boss will see you and if he sees you, you're out. But when there's no camera, you may take a short nap or spend your time chatting or do something else until the mudir comes in, then you fix yourself up quickly. This is the idea. This is human being. Why? Because the concept of being monitored will, will affect us. We, we have to behave a certain way. And to Allah belongs the best example. So when we keep in mind that Allah sees us, we can't go anywhere, even if you are behind closed doors, even if no one can see you. Once you want to start that computer or that TV or that whatever thing you were about to watch, and you remember that Allah is watching you, you will feel ashamed. You will lower your gaze when a woman goes by. Or when it comes, if it's on TV or something, even though no one is there. Why? Because you know Allah sees you. This quality, if is missing, if it's missing, then there's nothing that we can do for one of us. It becomes like a hopeless case. But this is ihsan which Allah loves. So the question which we should ask ourselves, are we from the muhsineen? Do, can one of us say, yes, I am from the muhsineen? If so, congratulations. Alhamdulillah, big ni'mah from Allah. If not, then we don't despair and we work on rectifying our condition so we can reach that level. The second ayah is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Very Allah loves those who often repent and He loves those who purify themselves. 
And the ayah is miraculous in a sense that it deals with external and internal purification. Allah loves the tawabin. Tawbah is an action of the heart. And mutatahirin, those who purify themselves. When you go to the bathroom, akramakallah, and you use the bathroom, then you actually wash your hands. Or even the istinja, or istijmar, in the bathroom. This is an act which is beloved to Allah, because it falls under purification. When you clean yourself, Allah loves it. When you make wudu, Allah loves it. When you smell nice, Allah loves it. This is why it is, according to many of the ulama, obligatory on the Muslim male to shower before he comes for Jumu'ah. He must shower. Because if you come straight from work and you smell bad because you've been working and it's hot, then you will harm everyone around you, including the malaika. And there's nothing more repulsive than someone walking by and then you have to go like this afterwards. And this is a quality which Allah hates. Because Allah loves those who do the opposite of that. Those who cleanse themselves, who look after themselves. That's how the Prophet used to be. His, his sweat was perfume. This is how good he smelled. So this is the minimum requirement for Jumu'ah. To dress for the occasion. To distinguish this day from other days. So that we know it's a Jumu'ah, we feel it's a different day, we don't treat it like any other day or any other Salah. Allah loves the Mutatahireen. at tawabin we have Tawbah, we have Ta'ib, and we have Tawab. Tawbah is repentance. Ta'ib is someone who repented. Could be two years ago, it could be something that he does occasionally. Tawab is someone who always, often, consistently repents. It's called in Arabic, Sigatul Mubalagha. It's a form of exaggeration or hyperbole. When you do something consistently, that's why when someone is a big liar, he always lies, they say, Kathab. You can say Kathib. He's a li he lied. Kathab, he's, he's someone who's a repulsive liar, he's always lying. Tawab is someone who's always repenting. Why? Why would someone be always repenting? Because we're always sinning. Does that mean that we should sin all the time and do tawbah? Or does it mean that we shouldn't sin to begin with? We should not sin to begin with. And that person is more beloved to Allah than the one who sins and falls and then repents. But the, the beautiful thing about Islam is that when one of us sins, when one of us sins and no one knows about the sin, you don't have to go confess to anyone. And you don't have to expose yourselves before the people. And you don't have to wait for some other person to forgive you. If it's the sin is between you and Allah, then between you and Allah you repent. And Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive that sin. As it comes in a hadith on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that Allah Azza wa Jal will bring the believer near to him. And he will remind him, Ya Fulan, you did this, and you did that, and you did this, and you did that. And Allah will enumerate the sins of the person. And then that believer will admit and confess, Yes, I have done so. I have committed these sins of Allah. So Allah will say to that person, I have concealed them for you in the dunya, and I shall forgive you in regards to them today. We ask Allah to make us among those. And that is the importance of repenting to Allah without publicizing our sins. That's why we have to avoid the public sins. Avoid the sins which are done publicly because these ones will exclude us from this particular hadith. We have to keep it a secret between us and Allah Azza wa Jal. Tawbah is a command given by Allah. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ and repent to Allah, all of you, those who have believed, perhaps you may attain success. Quickly, Tawbah has conditions, because some of us have a misconception. It says, okay, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh, khalas, I'm done. This is not Tawbah. This is an expression. Tawbah has conditions. Number one, it has to be for the sake of Allah. 
If you smoke cigarettes or something, and then you go to a doctor and the doctor says, you have to quit smoking, otherwise you will get cancer and die. And then you stop smoking to preserve your life, you did not do tawbah for Allah. You did tawbah for your life. You have to quit it for the sake of Allah. Number two, we have to feel regretful and remorseful and guilty over the sin. We have to feel bad. If we don't feel bad, it means we don't have a heart that is alive anymore. Number three, we should leave that sin alone, whatever it is. And if it's an obligation which we have not been fulfilling, we have to fulfill it. Number four, we have to have the intention never to return to it again. No short-term tawbah or part-time tawbah or vacational tawbah. As it is in the case with those who are called Ramadaniyun. They only repent in the month of Ramadan. Then when Ramadan ends for the next 11 months, they're back in the same old business. Then Ramadan comes, they repent again. This is not acceptable in the sight of Allah. When one of us leaves the sin, he has to leave it, leave it permanently. Now one may fall back into that sin. That's a different story. As long as at the time of Tawbah, the niyyah was not to go back to it again. Fifthly, it has to be done before one of us dies or before the sun rises from where it sets, which is the end of time. These are the conditions of Tawbah which we should have for every single sin. So the question is, are we actually fulfilling the conditions of Tawbah to attain Allah's love? This is a question which we should ask ourselves as well. And in the second khutbah, inshallah, we'll discuss the last quality. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Frankly, the ayat are are too many to enumerate, but we will conclude إن شاء الله with one more ayah, and that ayah actually encompasses all of the other ayat and it it addresses them as well, even if we don't give them their own mention. And that ayah is the one which which we should memorize, because it has to do with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And it is none but the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, meaning Allah is telling the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to say to people, Muslims and non-Muslims, those who are during his time and those who will come towards the end of time, say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Meaning the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Allah will love you and will forgive you your sin and verily Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. In this particular ayah we learn that the, the claim, the claim that we love Allah has to be substantiated by an action. Because people are very good in claiming. Anyone can tell you that I can do anything. But you really know whether that person is capable or not when the time comes for that performance. When the time comes to prove it. So you ask any believer, do you love Allah? No one will say no. In fact, if he were to say no, he would leave Islam. So naturally, when you say you love Allah, yes, of course. But Allah Azza wa Jal challenged us in this ayah. That that claim has to be proven. If you truly love Allah, then follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the result? Allah will love you. I mean, the, the ayah began by us trying to prove that we love Allah. And the result is that Allah will love us. If one of us loves Allah, that's not a big deal. Because we are worthless uh, slaves of Allah and Allah is the majestic. So it's, it's normal. But when Allah the majestic loves a slave of his, that's a big deal. So the, the result of that is that Allah will love one of us. How? By following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Alhamdulillah. Everything we need to know about the Prophet ﷺ has been conveyed to us. Anything which will get us closer to Allah has already been taught. So why is it that Muslims continue to turn away from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and favor over him other people and other thinkers and other philosophers and other doctors and other I don't know what. Seems that we want to follow everyone but the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And this is, by the way, why we are where we are today. This is why the ummah is suffering. This is why we need a lot to go back to what we used to be upon before. This is why we've been humiliated by our enemies. This is why all of the calamities have befallen us. 
because we have turned away from the way of the Prophet ﷺ. His way was the successful way which Allah revealed and therefore Allah granted him and the Sahaba success. And that requires a lecture of its own. But the time doesn't allow. I will conclude by quoting a hadith which inshallah should serve as an encouragement for each and every one of us to attain these qualities which Allah Azza wa Jal loves. In a hadith which is collected by Bukhari and narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu wa ardah, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَى جِبْرِيلٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبَّهِ If Allah loves a slave of his, then Allah will call on Jibreel alayhi salam. You all know Jibreel. And he will tell him, Verily, I love Fulan. Fulan means X person, meaning you or you or you, whatever your name is. Allah will call on by the name of that person, telling Jibreel, I love such person. So you love him. Then Jibreel will love that person. So Allah loves that person. Then Jibreel will love that person. Then Jibreel will call on to Malaika, the inhabitants of the sky. And he will say, Verily, Allah loves that person, so you love him. Then all of the Malaika will love that person. Then Allah will place love and acceptance for that person on earth. Can you imagine, Ya Akhi, that Allah loves you and, his, and Jibreel loves you and the Malaika love you and all the righteous people love you? What else do you want? Isn't this worth striving for until we die? Isn't this the ultimate objective in life to be able to enter paradise? Absolutely. But the hadith continues. The hadith continues by stating, and if Allah hates a slave of his, he will also call him Jibreel. And he will tell him that he hates that person, so Jibreel will hate him. Then the malaika will hate him, then Allah will put hatred for him on earth. Conclusion, you're sitting here now, you're one of these two. You're one of these two. Either Allah has already stated to Jibreel that he loves you, and so therefore all of the malaika, including Jibreel, love you, or the other way around. Allah. And brothers and sisters, we cannot afford, we cannot afford to be the second. Wallahi, even if you are the most, well, the wealthiest person, and the most prestigious person, and the one with the most qualifications, and you have all of the dunya with you. If you don't have that first quality, it will not benefit you with anything on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But you could be barely surviving, barely making ends meet, don't have enough salary, struggling every month, sending the money back home to your family, you don't get to eat properly, yet you are from the first, Wallahi, no one is better than you. No one is better than you. So from today, we have to realize what is it that we're missing out on? And where do we stand in regards to the love of Allah? Have we even been thinking about this? Have we been striving for it? If not, then like we learned in Tawbah, we do Tawbah now from this major deficiency in our deen, this major shortcoming. And Allah is merciful. Alhamdulillah, Allah is... You, you read it from the Fatiha. Allah is so merciful. And He's so happy that when one of us returns, that Allah Azza wa Jal will immediately accept this person. All we have to do is have that conviction and determination. And it doesn't take much. So let us begin today, inshallah, and strive to be righteous believers so that the Ummah will be righteous and Allah will bring back the honor of our predecessors to ourselves and our, the following generations. And very that is easy for Allah. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Rabbana aghfir lana wa lilmuslimin fi kulli makan. وارحمنا برحمتك وردنا إلى طاعتك ردا جميلا إنك ولي ذلك والقادر عليه والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد أقم الصلاة